morning to you. It's so good to be back with you. I'm thankful that all of you are here, as already has been said. We're thankful for our visitors. We do have visitors among us. And we want you to know that you have encouraged us so much by taking the opportunity to be here with us. And we hope you'll come back and be with us anytime that you have the opportunity. We'd love to take some time after worship is over to get to know you a little bit and just encourage you to come back, and we're thankful that you're here. Uh, I will let you know that the, the meeting I was in last week up in Ardmore went very, very well. And I only say that to you so you can rejoice with us. The, the elders there asked me to preach on spiritual growth, and I did that, and all week they were so very receptive. And we closed that meeting Wednesday with two baptisms. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. And I say that to you so you can understand that gospel meetings do still have their place. And they are still effective. And most importantly, the Word of God is still the power of salvation. And the Word of God will still convict the heart of those who are longing for something better. So rejoice with those brethren, and rejoice with me, and I'm thankful, though, that I had the opportunity to preach the gospel there, but I'm thankful that I'm back here to be with you, and I can preach the gospel here, and I thank you for the opportunity. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. One of the most misunderstood subjects when it comes to religion, if not the most misunderstood subject, is the grace of God. Many people will speak of God's grace without ever speaking of responsibility to God. Other people will speak of responsibility to God without ever speaking of God's grace. Both of those positions are wrong. Unfortunately, many people will speak of grace as if it gives them some license to sin and live as they want to. And that's a terrible thought as well. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The apostle said, may it never be. And there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. There's so many people in the world that teach falsely in regard to God's grace that it does cause a lot of confusion. But what we can know is that the Bible gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we can open the Bible and we can search the Scriptures. And we can find the things that we need to gain a clear understanding of the grace of God. And find confidence and assurance in that. And I find no better place to do so than in the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus. And here in the second chapter. And I'll ask you to read with me. Verses 11 through 14 as we begin this morning. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teach, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He begins verse 11 by saying, the grace of God that brings salvation. That's what grace has done. It's brought salvation. That we can access this unmerited favor of God. We, we didn't do anything to merit it. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God has so graciously extended salvation to us. His grace now is possible for all men to access. And that's where we want to begin. By noticing, first of all, that verse 11 teaches us that God's grace is for all. It's not just for us who are here this morning. And it's just not for some who are over in one place or some who are in another place. And, but the Bible teaches us that God's grace extends to every nation. Romans 1, verse 16, Paul says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for all men, for the Jew first, and also the Greek. It's the power of God to salvation for Jews and Gentiles alike. It wasn't only preached to the Jews. 
But the gospel went out into the world. Persecution arose upon the church at Jerusalem, and those saints were scattered, and they went out everywhere preaching the kingdom of God. Because that's what God desired. He wanted all men to hear the gospel, believe it, obey it, and access His grace by faith. Peter learned that lesson, didn't he? Peter was given the great commission. He heard Jesus say, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Peter heard that, but Peter didn't initially understand that until it came farther down the line, more revelation was given, and he learned that he as a Jew shouldn't show any partiality to those of the Gentile world. And as we find him at the house of Cornelius, when he enters into the house of Cornelius, and he's come to this understanding, he said these very words, and that's not what I put up there, but we've already read that. That's supposed to be the passage from Acts 10. But Peter said that he understood that God shows no partiality for everyone who fears Him and works righteousness is acceptable before Him. That's what he learned. He came to understand that. So we come to understand that God's grace has been extended to all men, to every nation. So then every nation can access this wonderful, unmerited favor of God and have salvation in Christ Jesus. John's words in 1 John 2 and verse 2 really ring clear here. Speaking of Christ, as John has told us, that we shouldn't sin. Don't sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he goes on to say in verse 2, speaking of Jesus, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation is not something that you use all the time, is it? I mean, that's not normal conversation. We bring up the word propitiation and talk about that. But we can understand that word. I mean, it's not a difficult word to understand. It may be difficult to say sometimes. But it's just talking about appeasement of wrath. Because man was given to sin. It went against the will of God. And the wrath of God was to be poured out on man because of that sinful nature. But Jesus made propitiation for that sin. It's another word for atonement. Atonement has been made. Jesus has appeased the wrath of God that was coming against mankind because of their sin. And now, because atonement has been made, we can access that. That perfect sacrifice. Propitiation can be made on our behalf so that we can have salvation in Jesus Christ. And what's the most famous Bible verse that everyone knows? Is it not John 3 and verse 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Even non-religious people can quote that passage. But it is a very powerful passage of Scripture. And it says much of what John said in his first epistle in the second chapter. For God, it didn't just say that God loved the world. It said that God so loved the world. That speaks of the great magnitude of God's love. That God so loved the world that He gave the world a gift that the world did not deserve. So that through now accessing this wonderful gift and in responding to the gift of God's love, we can have everlasting life in Jesus Christ. That's just not for me. That's just not for you. But God has extended that grace to the whole world. Every person in every nation can have access to the wonderful gift of salvation made possible by the wonderful grace of God. God's grace is for all. Secondly, we notice from Titus chapter 2 in the 12th verse that not only is God's grace for all, but also we must understand that God's grace, it has requirements. Because not only has the grace of God appeared to bring salvation to all men, grace teaches us from verse 12, it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we are to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So God's grace has requirements, doesn't it? That's just what Titus t is told in the 12th verse. So God's grace, as wonderful as it is, and as we do not deserve it, we didn't merit it, there's nothing that you've done to achieve it. 
it still has requirements. And the requirement of God's grace is godly living. That's what the Holy Spirit said in Titus chapter 2. Peter said it well in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11 when he said, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. That word abstain is strong, isn't it? When you abstain from something, if a person is trying to abstain from drinking alcohol, what's he doing? He's keeping himself away from it, isn't he? He's putting it far away from him so he can have no involvement with it whatsoever because he recognizes how harmful it is to him. A person who is trying to overcome drug addiction and they're told to abstain from drug addiction. What do they do? They put those drugs away and they try to keep themselves from them because they realize the negative effect that it's having upon their lives. Peter says generally as a whole that we as Christians, as God people, God's people, we must abstain from the lust of the flesh. Those things that tempt us and pull at us and try to pull us away from God. Abstain from those things. Put them far away from you. Don't have association with those things to the point to where they have a negative effect on you and lead you away from this wonderful grace that God has so graciously extended to you. Abstain from those things. Why? Because they war against the soul. They're trying to pull you back into the world and not lead you in the direction that God wants you to go. So we need to be careful. Why? Well, John says it further in the second chapter of his first epistle when he said, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of this world. Friends, those three things that are mentioned in verse 16 have been the downfall of mankind from the very beginning. That's what happened to Eve in the garden. It was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Oh, the, the, the fruit was good for food. It looked good. And it was, Satan said, it would make you wise, just as God was. And those things have been the bane of man all down through time. But God hasn't left us without. He says, look, here, I'm reminding you of these things. These are the things that are going to trip you up and cause you to fall. And they're out there, and you be mindful of those things. That if you love these things, if you give more effort and attention to these things than you do to those things above, you know what? Then you're going to be proving that you love the world more than you love God, and you have nothing to do with the Father. That's a terrible place to be in. But the person who understands God's grace and who is mindful of the fact that God paid a price for him or her that he could not pay himself, that person understands now, you know what, I need to abstain from these fleshly lusts because there's no access while I'm living according to the flesh. I realize we're living in fleshly bodies. That's not what the statement means. When we're living for the flesh and for the things of the flesh, those things will separate us from God. We have to be mindful and understand that God is calling upon me in the life that I'm living right now to step up and stand above the rest of the world. Why? Because of who you are. Sometimes I think people read verse 12 and they say, well, you know, Paul told Titus to live soberly, righteously, and godly in that present age, but he's not really talking about our age. That's silly talk. Every age has a present age, doesn't it? It was a present age in Titus's day, and he had to overcome the temptations of that present age. And every age has its temptations in its own time. And you and I have those things. Oh, and they come to us much faster than they probably came to Titus, didn't they? Titus didn't have to open up his computer every day and see all the junk that was thrown at him. But it's not that he didn't have evil to overcome. He did. And he was to overcome that just as we are to overcome it in our present age. And we can do that. It's a requirement for us to do so. Why is that? I think it's because of what Peter had to say back in his first epistle toward the end of that, beginning in verse 24. Having already spoken of the Word of God, being that seed that doesn't perish, he goes on to say this, because all flesh is grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away. 
but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which was, by the gospel, was preached to you. Why do we need to live soberly and righteously and godly in every present age? Because the Word of God endures forever. It's alive in every age. It's significant in every age. You won't find an age as long as this world continues that the Word of God will not be significant in that age. You won't find an age that the Word of God will not be the power of God to salvation. It's that in every age, as long as man lives upon the earth, the Word of God will be significant. It will be powerful. And in every age then, we need to be able to abstain from worldly lust, even in the wickedness of ages. Aren't you reminded of Noah? You think of Noah, and in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, when we begin reading that chapter, and we find in verse 5 that God looked down upon the earth and he saw that the intentions of the hearts of men were only wicked continually. And God said, I'm going to destroy them. That's a pretty rough society, isn't it? I mean, people were, I mean, all they cared about was just being wicked. But you read on down to verse 8, and it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Even in the wickedest society you can read about in the scriptures, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what we learn is, even in the midst of great wickedness, you find a man who is striving to do his best to live for the Lord, who understood who God is and what God had done for him. And even in the midst of a bunch of people who could have cared less about anything Noah had to say, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And he was preaching to those people as he was building that ark. Because God told Noah, because of who you are and because of the life you're striving to live, I'm extending my grace to you. And Noah accessed that grace by faith through obedience to the commands of God. And he found salvation, didn't he? He and his family. But God's grace had requirements. And it has requirements for you and I too. Not that we earn it. Not that we're doing something that we merit it. That's not it. But please understand this. Just because God asked me to live soberly, righteously, and godly does not negate God's grace. Ladies and gentlemen, that gives you access to it. And as I live in the midst of a wicked world, if I strive to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age that I'm living in, I can know and understand that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God as a propitiation for my sins, and He's mediating on my behalf, and thank God for that. Whatever requirements God's asking of me, I'll be glad to keep them. Why? Well, that takes us to verse 13, doesn't it? Because this grace that has brought salvation to all men, this grace that has requirements attached to it, it also brings us hope. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So you tie that together with verse 12. And he's saying now, as you understand these requirements, as you're striving your very best, I know you're not perfect and I'm not either. But I understand that Jesus is. And I understand that the grace of God now has been made possible through the sacrifice of perfect Jesus. For me who was not perfect, and that God demonstrated His own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I understand now, while I'm try, striving to live soberly, righteously, and godly, I'm looking above to that glorious hope that I have. The glorious hope, the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. We have a hope, you see, that never, ever dies out. You ever had a hope that just didn't work out like you wanted it to? I think about the man who has been working at a, at a job. Maybe it's a factory job and he's been working there for a long time. Seems he's just been called in the same rut of a job for a long time. And he's a great worker. He's always there on time. 
He does everything that he's asked to do. He never complains. But he's just never got that step up. You know what I mean? He's just never been able to go to that next level. Oh, and it'd be great for him. I mean, his family could benefit from it. One day, a promotion comes up along down the line. And his manager comes to him and says, Hey, you're a great worker, and we've, we've recognized that. And you know what? There's a promotion coming up, and I believe you're a shoe-in for it. Oh, and he goes home. He tells his wife, You'll never believe what they told me today. They told me I was a shoe-in for that promotion. Our life is going to be so much better. We can do this and we can do that now. We'll be able to put some money back for a rainy day. And he's got this anticipation and it goes on for maybe several months. And then the day comes when it's going to be announced and he doesn't get it. What's happened to his hope? It's been squashed, hasn't it? His hope has disappointed him. And that's what happens in this life, doesn't it? We have hopes that disappoint because they die and they're not there anymore. But what the Bible teaches us is that we have a living hope. And Peter addresses that specifically in the first part of his first epistle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Did you catch Peter saying that we have a living hope? We've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is not coincidence that those two things are joined together because Jesus is alive today. Our hope in Christ is alive. Jesus is never going to die. Jesus is living forever at the right hand of God, and because Jesus lives forever, our hope lives forever, doesn't it? Oh, what a wonderful thought that is. It's a hope that never disappoints. You know what? There's a lot of hopes you'll have in this life. They're going to disappoint you, and they're going to die out, and you may even be ashamed of them. But the apostle said of this same hope in Romans 5 and verse 5, that this hope does not disappoint. No, it doesn't. It will never disappoint you. And because this hope never disappoints us, because it's alive always as Jesus is always alive, then we persevere because of it. He said in Romans chapter 8 that we're saved in this hope. But if we hope for the things that we see, then there's no hope there, is it? But we don't hope for the things that we see, but for the things that we do not see. And we wait eagerly for those things with perseverance. If we have hope in what we see right now, we are the most <laughs> pitiful people, aren't we? Because if we're only hoping in the material things of this life, you know what? Those things may be here today, but gone tomorrow. And we've all experienced that. But the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is a living hope. It's a hope that will never die out. It will always be alive because Jesus lives forever. And because of that, no matter what may happen here, we continue to press on and persevere and to keep reaching forward. Even though the valley may get dark and times may be low, Jesus is always sitting on the throne. He's always alive. And His grace is still there. And because of that, I'll strive to be holy. John said in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has what hope? I'm a child of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on me. I wasn't worthy of that, were you? I did nothing to merit that, did you? 
I can call God my Father and He sees me as His child. The world doesn't understand that because they don't understand God. But we do. And we understand that to the point to where we know that one day this life's going to be over, but I'm going to go home to glory and I'm going to see Jesus as He is in eternal glory. And not only that, I'm going to be made like Him. I'm going to be glorified like my Lord. Oh, that's the hope, isn't it? That's what you press on for. And when you have that hope within you, you purify yourself just as Jesus is pure. I'll strive to be holy. Why? Because I've got a hope that's alive. And it never dies. And it never, ever disappoints. And it's because of that. That verse 13, 14 comes in. That then is our motivation. We've got this wonderful grace that's extended to all men. Salvation has requirements attached to it, doesn't it? The grace that God has extended to all men, that grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly. But why would I not? when I understand the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And therefore, that hope becomes my motivation. Speaking of Jesus, our hope, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who are zealous for good work. People who are motivated. What are they motivated by? They're motivated by God's grace. And because what God's grace makes possible for them. I think we do well to go back to the book of Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 with me. To get a good understanding of this. If you spend any time with Brother Hall... You'll learn this really quick. You can learn a lot from the letter to the Ephesians. Many people will go right to the fourth chapter and start talking about what the, Paul the Apostle has asked us to do as far as living our lives and bypass the first three. But in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, he gives us what motivates us to do the things he's asked us to do at the end of the letter. In chapter 1, he talks to us about how we have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, beginning, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as by sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of His glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. What do we have? God's grace has made possible all spiritual blessings that we enjoy in Christ Jesus. Just think about that. God made it possible for us before He created anything for us to have salvation in Christ. God made that hope possible before the foundation of the world. God made it possible for us to be a part of the church universal, to be called His. He made it possible for us to have the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we may come to know Him and serve Him and have all the instruction that we need to do so. And those spiritual blessings could go on and on and on. In chapter 2, he says that grace has made possible the very fellowship that we have with Christ. Let's pick up reading in verse 4 of chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. By the grace of God, we now have been raised up together to sit with Jesus in the heavenly places. That we have this spiritual realm that we're able to, to have fellowship with the Lord. What a wonderful thing that is. To know that we have that type of communion. The greatest we've already enjoyed this morning. By partaking of the Lord's Supper. He says, look, you haven't done this by your own meritorious works. But you, this has been accomplished for you because God has made it possible by the way of grace. But that's by faith, and you access grace by faith, right? By meeting those requirements. And those requirements are us to be zealous for those good works that God has given us to do, right? Grace has made that fellowship with Christ possible for us. Even in chapter 3, in verses 7 and 8, we're told... Of Paul speaking of he being a minister according to the gift of grace given to him by the effective working of his power. He says to me who am less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that I may preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul says it's by the grace of God that I can preach the gospel. And let me say this to you this morning it's by the grace of God that that revelation was made that we can stand up and preach the gospel this morning. So that you and I could come to know and understand how to access God's wonderful grace. All of those things, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, are what God's grace has made possible for us. But those three right there are pretty heavy, aren't they? Then, you see, you come to chapter 4. Then you find the word, therefore. Based on what's already been said. Because all spiritual blessings are made possible by God's grace. Because that you've been made to sit with Christ in the heavenly places. Because of His grace. Because the wonderful gospel has been revealed by His grace. Now, therefore, this is your incentive to go out into the world and put away lying and sinful anger. This is now your incentive to no longer steal or use harmful words. This now is your incentive to put away bitterness and wrath and all that malicious living. Why? Because of God's grace. If you go to work tomorrow, and let's just say that you work for a boss who's not so nice, any of you got one of those? And it may be that he asks you to do something tomorrow that's just one of the most difficult things you've ever done. And it's not something that has to do with, with your job. It's not one of the obligations and responsibilities of every specific job. But he's asking you to step out and do something just because he's asked you to. Because he doesn't want to do it. Maybe he's asking you to go and tell someone that they're going to be fired. But that's not your responsibility, that's his. But as you look back over the years while you've worked there, this guy has treated you like you were nothing. He's never been nice to you a day in his life. You've worked your fingers to the bone, and he's never considered you for anything to go up a step above as far as job is concerned. Are you going to have any incentive to do what he asks you to do that you're not obligated to do? Not at all. But we turn this around now, dude, to God. And what God has asked of us. We're obligated now to do the things that God has asked of us. And some of those things are hard. It may be that if you're going to make your life right with God, you've got to give up friends, you've got to give up family, you've got to give up a lot of practices and a lot of places that you go that you can't go anymore. And it's going to be tough. Believe me, it's going to be tough, isn't it? But when you understand what you have in Jesus Christ, 
When you understand that the grace of God has been extended to you that you did not earn, that you're not worthy of, but God said, here's my grace, you can access it. And you can have all spiritual blessings in Christ. I'm going to raise you up and you can sit with Jesus in the heavenly places. And you can know that you're operating, though you're here on earth, in a spiritual realm. And isn't that motivating? And you can know that the grace of God has revealed all things that pertain to life and godliness. You can be equipped thoroughly for every good work that God needs you to be zealous to do. And if I understand those things, you know what? When I realize the price has been paid for me that I could not pay on my own, you know what? I'm going to work as hard as I can to put away lying and sinful talk. I'm going to put away stealing and harmful words. I'm going to try my best to stop all of that stuff. Why? Because of the grace of God. That's why. So not only is grace extended to all men, and not only does grace have requirements attached to it, but those requirements seem quite wonderful when you think about the hope that you have in Jesus Christ because it's a living hope, a hope that never dies out and it never disappoints. And because I have that hope then, and I recognize what God has made possible for me, I'm going to be motivated now. My incentive for living soberly, righteously, and godly is the grace of God itself. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 says we access grace by faith. We know from 10, 17 that grace, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So we access God's grace when we come to believe what the scriptures teach, and when we obey the commands of the gospel, we access God's grace and our sins are forgiven. But God asks us furthermore, while we have accessed His grace initially, now live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Why? Because we are in continual need of God's grace, aren't we? Because none of us are perfect. And we need continued access to the throne and thank God that we can have it. Thank God for the hope that we have. Please, brethren, friends, let that motivate you to access God's grace. You may be here this morning and you're not a Christian. If you've heard the gospel and you believe it, why haven't you yet obeyed it? Do you understand what you're giving up? If you miss heaven for this world, you're going to miss everything. But this morning, you can access this wonderful gift that we've been talking about by faith. You can come repenting of all of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. And as a new creature now, you can set your mind on things above, dedicate yourself to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Christian, have you wandered or you wavered? Maybe you need to access God's grace or forgiveness. You can do that. We all make mistakes, and we all fall off the path sometimes. But you don't have to stay there. Can we help someone this morning make their life right with God? If we can, won't you please come while we stand and we sing this song? Yeah.